make sure I don't. Well, I see people are starting to join. Yes, absolutely. We'll wait a, another minute or so and let people join and then we'll get started. People who are joining us now, um, I'll invite you to say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. Love to hear from you. We also have the Q&A feature, so you can always uh, put things in there as well, but um, great, somebody's joining us from Toronto. Welcome. Oh, another person from Ontario. Ottawa, thanks for joining us. Another person from Toronto. Excellent. Okay, well, I think we'll get started. People can join. We, of course, do record these sessions, so they're always available afterwards. So welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining tonight's webinar. Um, tonight's topic is about getting our students with dyslexia ready for high school, which is a timely topic as we're headed into June and grade eight graduation is coming up. Um, I'm Alicia, I'm the executive director of Dyslexia Canada. I am also the parent of a child with dyslexia who's in grade nine right now. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And of course I have dyslexia as well. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just do a land acknowledgement. Um, we are joining today on a virtual platform, but we, from coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge that the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation people that call this land home. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historical connection to the land, and we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous people and their cultures. This acknowledgement reminds us of our responsibilities to our relationships and the ancest ancestral lands on which we all learn, share and live. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. Again, Dyslexia Canada is a national charity and our mission is to ensure that every child in Canada with dyslexia receives a fair and equitable education. And of course, um, the times when our students are transitioning from one part of education to another part can be a particularly tricky part. And that's why I'm very excited that we're able to offer this webinar tonight with our uh, featured speaker, Michael Karras, who's joining us from Saskatchewan. I first um, encountered Michael through this podcast that was put out by the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario a few years ago. Um, and it was a recording of a keynote speech that Michael gave at the Educators Institute in Toronto. Um, I'm not sure what year you did that, Michael, um, but it's Ooh. called Behind Enemy Lines, How That Student Became Vice Principal. Uh, and of course, the title grabbed me right away. And then I started listening to the, the speech and I realized that this is a person who had a lot of insight into what it's like to be a student with dyslexia and ADHD. It, as a, a student, but also as an educator, because Michael is a teacher now, uh, vice principal, and has brought that experience and that insight into his practice. And I really encourage you, if you have not had a chance to listen to this podcast, I've linked it on these slides, and we will, of course, send the slides in a follow-up email to everyone. And I'd encourage you to listen to the entire keynote. Uh, but now I'll invite Michael to share with you just a little bit about his background and what he, why he um, 
what brought him here today to this point. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for everyone who um, has joined us. Um, I'm honored to uh, be asked to uh, speak with you all today. Um, yeah, so uh, a bit about me. I grew up in a small town, uh, South uh, Saskatchewan, a uh, mining town, farming town, um, but uh, always had trouble uh, with reading, writing, um, was very, very active, hyperactive, lots of trouble focusing. Um, we moved uh, from that town to Regina and in, I think I was in grade one or two, um, but I ended up getting diagnosed quite early. Um, my, my father uh, had a learning disability undiagnosed and my grandpa also had a learning disability undiagnosed. So my parents knew that there was something going on. Um, so I ended up going to the University of Regina and getting a bunch of different studies done on me, which ended up being ed psych and you know things like that. I didn't know that at the time. Um, but back then, um, when I did get diagnosed with, with dyslexia and ADHD, my parents were able to take that information to the schools, but nobody knew what to do. So just straight there, we have a bit of advantage now days that, that we know a bit more about dyslexia. We know a bit more about learning disabilities in general, and, uh, teachers have a better understanding of what they can, can do to, to, to help. So that's a, a big positive that, that has come, uh, um, since I was, a, since I was a kid. Um, we moved around a lot and I ended up going to uh, several elementary schools, couple high schools, and SIAST, uh, uh, which would be like a polytech or, or something like that, and university. Um, worked out to 13 different educational institutions by the time I graduated university. So moved around a lot of different schools, had a lot of different teachers, a lot of different struggles and problems uh, uh, making my way through there. Uh, but yeah, I ended up being a special ed teacher at a high school for, for eight years um, and then became a vice principal. And I've been a vice principal for, for 14 years now, 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so for tonight's webinar, we've uh, organized a number of topics. So one thing I did was I posted on Facebook and Twitter and asked parents, about their questions. What are you most curious about? What are you most nervous about? And, and also for parents that have children who've already gone through high school, um, what are your biggest tips? And out of that, I came up with sort of six categories that we're gonna frame our discussion tonight. Um, and I'm gonna chat with Michael about each of these. We also have Sandra here from Dyslexia Canada. Um, hi, Sandra. And uh, Sandra is uh, monitoring the chat and the Q&A and Sandra is gonna jump in at various points as well. Um, to also ask some questions of Michael. So our first topic of discussion is communication. Um, so one thing, I re-listened to the podcast tonight, and one thing that um, jumped out at me was that you were talking about how when you first um, took a role in special education, that you made a point of going to the elementary schools and meeting with all of the grade eight students that were coming in, not just the kids that were um, special education labeled, you know, but all of the kids. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, so we'll start off with the, the questions really like about communication, you know, why is that really important? Um, what can parents do? And, and how does that look different in high school than it does in elementary school? Absolutely. Yeah. Communication is huge. Um, as parents, you probably know this with your, with your, uh, uh, your kids, your students. Um, Communication is a really big thing. Um, at an elementary school, it's a lot easier because you're dealing with uh, possibly one teacher, maybe two. Um, you know, they might go to a band teacher or something, but you're for the most part, you're dealing with one teacher um, per year, possibly even the same teacher the second year or something like that. In a high school, and again, depending on the size of the school, um, even a small, small high school, um, it's, it's quite possible and, and most likely that, that your, your child's going to have 10 different teachers in grade nine. Um, so every one of those teachers need to have some background information. And it's difficult as a, as a teacher, from the teacher's point of view, 
um, to know all of those students and what they need on a, you know, every day on a daily basis. Um, so that communication is really, really key from the parents to the teachers, but is also from the student to the teacher as well. Um, what you need, what you want, what you, what your disability is, how they can help. And they'll often need lots of reminders. Um, keeping in mind, you know, class sizes keep rising, you know, just here, at, I'm at a, quite a small school. Um, just here, though, you know, 26, 27 kids isn't unheard of here. I talked to some of my friends who, who work at some of the larger high schools in Saskatoon, and they'll have 33 to 37 in a class. Well, you multiply that by five classes a day, they're seeing a lot of kids a day. So to, to remember what every kid needs on a regular basis can be really difficult. And that's why it's so important to, to you know, have those open communication lines with, with the teachers, um, as well as your, your, your son or daughter. Um, that's a really big one too. And, and I think that was one of the really important things that my parents did with me was, you know, come to us, tell us what's going on, tell us what you have for work, tell us what you, how you did, what you didn't do, what you did well, what you did wrong, so that we can work together as a team uh, uh, to fix those things. Um, another big one, and this drops off a lot, and I've noticed it uh, uh, over my career, after elementary school, parents seem to stop going to parent-teacher interviews. Please go to your parent-teacher interviews, student-led conferences. I don't know what they call them, um, where you're from, but you, you got to go. They're, they're so important. Um, not only do they mean a lot to your, to your son or daughter, but they mean a lot to the teacher. Um, not, they're able to discuss with you and in person versus email is so much easier to remember than it is, you know, versus reading an email, hey, my son or daughter has dyslexia. If I meet you and get build a relationship with you and I see you in person, I'm going to be able to remember that and remember your son or daughter more and be able to, to help them more effectively. So communication, hands down, probably one of the most important things as a parent um, that, you, that you really need to focus on. Um, how do you do that stuff, though, is, is really important as well. Things are quite a bit different where I am. I was talking with, with Alicia. Um, there's not a lot of supports for students with learning disabilities here. Um, it's more of um, like there's a special ed teacher in every school, but the support actually comes from the, the teacher themselves, the classroom teacher themselves versus an EA or, you know, uh, ed psych or SLP or, or OT um, helping those students. Um, so when, when parents come in or students come in and are able to explain to the teacher who may have no idea what you're talking about or what dyslexia is and maybe has never had a student before with dyslexia or didn't know they did, right? If you have that information, it's very helpful versus them having to look it up. So having, having proper information, I guess, factual information um, is, is very beneficial as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, making sure that you have the information and you can share it and bringing it in in that form. Um, and that's something Dyslexia Canada can definitely help with. So if there's any parents here who are looking for resources that you can use to start that discussion, uh, please reach out to us through, you know, just we have a form on the website or you can email info at dyslexia and, and Sandra will answer you. <laughs> we, we've got that stuff covered for sure. And when I was taught, um, when I was getting responses back from parents uh, who have older students, university students um, on Facebook and Twitter, like very much that piece of making sure you meet all the teachers, making sure you reach out ahead of time to all of the teachers, make sure they're aware of the IEP. Because just because there's an IEP or an I ILP in place doesn't mean that the either. teacher necessarily knows. Because you're or right. Even, or even has, knows it's there. Even knows it's there, yeah. So yeah. when you've got a class, like you say, of 30 and you've got in Ontario, it'd be four classes a day in Saskatchewan, it sounds like it's five, um, but it's still either way you cut it. That's a lot of kids that they've got to um, juggle. Um, so you can't take for granted that they're going to know that there's an IEP in place. 
Um, so reaching out ahead of time is really smart. And I love that point about going to going to the parent teacher interviews. I have to be completely honest. I was negligent in that this year too. It was the first time that I did not do that. I was always there. So the, you know, president of the parent council just in elementary school, just so that I could spend more face time with the uh, principal and vice principal and all the teachers. But uh, in high school, I kind of dropped the ball on that too. So I will take your advice. I will go next next time they come up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next topic that uh, we wanted to, to touch on is around uh, goals and plans. And this is really around planning out the entire high school uh, path that your student is going to be taking, really taking some time to think about what do they want to do after high school um, and considerations for, you know, how you're going to get them there. Bearing in mind that, you know, things take longer when you have dyslexia. I know that that was the case for me. Um, and uh, so really in terms of goals and plans, Michael, like what do you think is, uh, or why do you think it's important to really consider this? And and what sort of tips do you have for parents and students on planning your high school um, sure. path? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, how do you? Every school is going to have um, like a, a student guidance counselor or something along those lines to help the students plan what they want to do in their their future life, right? Kids with learning disabilities, ADHD, and in general, kids that are 14, 15 years old are not looking, hey, I wanna, you know what I mean? Like 99% of them aren't, hey, I'm gonna be an ophthalmologist when I, you know, <laughs> that, that, that just doesn't happen, right? So getting them to start thinking about different careers, getting them start trying out different types of jobs to see if they'd like those different careers. I think that's the, the, the main goal right, to kind of uh, get them going in some sort of direction. Um, and you, you'll you know your, your sons and daughters as well, like they're good at this, they're not so good at that. These are the types of jobs they might be well good at or suited for career-wise. But to get to that point, there's lots of little goals and things we have to plan for from grade nine to grade 12 and beyond um, that are really important. The biggest one, I think, is uh, planning out your, your um, class schedules. Um, I highly encourage anybody who has, you know, a significant learning disability not to take a full load. Um, especially when you get out of high school at university, absolutely do not take a full load. Um, we have what's called, or at my school here, we set up what's called like a resource room spare. Um, I still take attendance for the kids. They will go either to the library or to a designated spot. And there's usually someone that'll check on them like myself or the special ed teacher or, or somebody um, that's available. Um, and during that time, they're able to work on homework. They will get help from, from teachers, things like that to stay on top of, of their academics, um, but also to deal with stress, to deal with the mental health part of it. Um, and all of those things have to be kind of planned. Um, it's interesting, um, I will, oh, how old is, I would have been probably my third year teaching um, when my partner, my other special ed teacher that I worked with um, said, how do you, how do you come to work every day and not know what you're doing and I said well because I have everything planned and I have it written down and on a day planner or a google calendar or something like that so I don't have to like everything's planned out already <laughs> and, and instead of instead of just kind of willy-nilly it right and so when you're when you're um, setting these goals setting these plans you have to make sure that you're staying really organized uh, and you have to teach your sons and daughters to, to do that as well. So the hardest thing for me when I was growing up was trying to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Trying to use some sort of like a day planner or trying to use some sort of um, like a Google calendar because like technology back then was didn't exist, right? Um, plus, I couldn't spell, couldn't write, you know, things like that. So things are so much easier now for tracking your goals and tracking your plans 
that there really is no excuse, you know, that, that you can't say, oh, I didn't know anymore, right? Um, so to, to set those goals and set them uh, appropriate is what you need, need to look at, at doing, right? And I would suggest that, you know, making organizational goals are really important, making those academic goals are really important, um, but also focus on the plans that will get you to those, those spots as well, right? And like I said, those plans may include picking your classes, you know, appropriately. If you're really bad at math, then maybe don't take two maths and a science in one semester. So, you know what I mean? Plan making those plans appropriately um, is really, really important. Spreading out if you have trouble reading and writing. You don't want to be taking English and creative writing back to back. Right or English and history back to back, two two classes that include a lot of writing and memory. You don't want to have back to back. It's really draining and stressful. So think about those kind of things when you're planning out your education and the goals that you're setting. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that definitely sounds about right. There was something in the podcast that stood out for me, which I just sort of wish that I had thought of or done, or somebody had told me to do. Uh, later on when when you were talking about being in university and taking your hardest courses in uh, like a summer session or something like that. So you yeah. really have to focus on one thing at a time. I thought that was really smart. Well, and, I, and I didn't get a lot of help until after high school, right? It was in university that I got a lot, got a lot more help. And that was one of the smartest things I ever did was take the hardest class like English and things that were really difficult for me to take them in a summer session and inner session uh, over the summer um, and that was like and again it, it all came down to setting goals and, and having a proper academic plan that was successful for me right not, it, for me not for everybody but for me specifically that's a really important point there like the plan that's going to make sense for you um, somebody mentioned or somebody asked in the chat about the uh, your talk about the um, uh, uh, spare the the spare where the kids go to the learning support room um and so is that standard in saskatchewan that um that kids can take a not full workload because this person's saying that they're in uh in ontario and they've been told that um in grades 9 to 11 kids have to take a full course load every year they've been sort of shut down on their ask for a reduced workload so i'm just curious is that um acceptable like in saskatchewan does that happen for grade 9 to 11 kids or um, well, I can't speak for every school, but, but at your school, <laughs> at, at my school, grade, grade, grade nine is still considered middle school. So yes, grade, grade nine across Canada is still considered middle school. So yes, grade nine, is not a credit base, right? But grade 10, 11, and 12 is credit base. And I, I believe it's credit base across the country. Um, so there's no way they can mandate you to take full load. That just is ridiculous. I can't, I can't, I can't see any anybody being able to mandate you taking a full load. However, I have we have poll classes for grade eights. We have poll classes for grade sevens. Like we offer French. I'm not going to let a kid. Well, I'm not going to make a kid who can't read and write in English take French. This, that doesn't make any sense. So we pull those students and we teach them skills and strategies to help them with their learning disabilities or whatever they got right. Um, so there, there's ways around it, I guess. Um, you just have to, to look into it. Now, that being said, like I said, grade nine is still um, like a um, middle years. So yes, they have to take all of the courses, but there's still got to be somewhere where they can take, you know, some support, like a special ed support help class, or, or, or maybe it's once a week, maybe it's twice a week. Um, but when you're in the credit system, you know, Kids can take take whatever classes they want. They need 24 credits in Saskatchewan to graduate. Um, you know, there's up to they can take up to 10 a year, um, so they can graduate with 30 30 credits. I suspect, much like what I try to do, is I try to pound as many classes and credits into kids in grade 10, 11, so that in grade 12 we're not struggling to get them to graduate. So that's probably what they're thinking is from the school, not knowing the person in the actual situation, but that's what I'm guessing. Sure, that makes if sense. I, Mr. If I just interject too, I've been told the same thing. I'm in Ontario as well, and our school board will not allow any child to take. You have to have a minimum of 30 credits before you can take a spare. 
so we have grade nine is credited as well. And uh, so we cannot take there. But we do have a course that you can take called Learning Strategies that I understand you got in Saskatchewan. But that is a, a course where they can get support. For the so there is, so there's something. And it, it, every province is going to be different, right? So yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's the thing though, the, the balance workload and trying to plan because uh, high school in Ontario, it used to be five years, right? And then they put it down to four years. Um, I've been trying to convince my son from the get go to just plan for it being five years. You know, he has dyslexia too, and um, well, just stretch it out if you can. So that's a battle I'm willing to fight if any other parents are looking for an ally in that fight. I well, and like there's I absolutely nothing out. wrong with that. And, 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 the, and here's the argument for it. And, and, why would I like okay? I'm on a five credit five credit system uh, per semester up to ten credits, right? Grade ten to twelve, not grade nine is considered middle middle school. So you need twenty four credits to graduate. And then there's core classes and so on and so on. But why would I force a kid to take five credits, fail three, instead of taking four credits and pass all four? It doesn't make it. it it's it's not helping me or the school. And I'm the vice principal. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not helping the kid. It's not helping the teacher. It's not helping the parents. It's not helping our school. It's making our school look bad because now he's failing three classes and I'm only passing two instead of passing four. So to be able to adjust this, the, the school schedule is only beneficial for everyone. And I, I think that's the argument you got to take. I 100% agree, and I think this is why we need more teachers and principals who have dyslexia and ADHD and who understand it, you know, get it from that perspective. It's a very rare perspective, is what I'd say. Um, yeah, you, yeah. Um, I, I think it's, uh, this kind of dovetails nicely into our next topic, really, so I'm going to keep us moving along on our slides. Sure. Um, so our next topic is about the social-emotional well-being, and like you said, you know, overloaded class you know, schedule, you know, you've got a kid that's struggling because the workload is so high. Um, you know, there are a lot of demands and it is a really tough time for kids. It's a tough time. High school is a tough time for every kid. You know, you throw in dyslexia on top of that and, and other issues that kids may have, and it can be really, really difficult. Um, so I know that you talked a lot about this in your podcast, and, and this is something that's near and dear to your heart as well. Um, so the social, emotional well-being and the mental health of our students with with learning disabilities, dyslexia, ADHD, you know, why is it why is it important for us to be thinking about this? And really, what can parents do? Yeah, this is this is a tough one. Um, oh, how do I go about this? <laughs> maybe maybe I'll share stories instead of give tips on this one. I don't know. Um, for me, growing up not knowing or, or knowing and not being able to get the help, um, you know, having difficulty with social situations sometimes, friendships, uh, moving schools a lot, different teachers a lot. Um, eventually, I got to a point where you could see all your friends moving on, doing well, and I was just kind of sinking, right? that we want to avoid um at all at all costs and especially right now uh, you know since since covid everybody all the kids are really struggling right so it just exacerbates the problem when it comes to people with or kids with learning disabilities the biggest biggest fear i have for kids growing up now is that they often will turn to drugs um you know self-medicate um, alcohol, um, things along those lines, which then in turn, you know, you, lots of bad choices, criminal behavior, um, suicide, jail, all those things end up following, right? That's why I think I mentioned it earlier when I was talking about communication, why it's so important for parents to, to keep those lines of communication open with, with your child. Um, I was extremely lucky to have you know, very, very supportive parents, uh, very supportive family, um, you know, brother and sister who were helpful, my, my, my mom and dad who were helpful, um, and we were very close. Not everybody has that, right? And that, that's another factor in there as well. 
Um, some people um, can afford counselors and you know all those kind of things. Some people can't. We I grew up really poor and we couldn't afford those things. Um, so a lot of that stuff kind of had to be dealt with as a, in the family unit. And again, that's it's it's unique for every individual. Um, but for me, things really did end up diving really, really, really bad. Um, I got into drugs and alcohol and and um, very very depressed, and it was really difficult to get out of that. And it's really important to pay attention to that. If you see your son or your daughter sliding or slipping or, or starting to ex exhibit behaviors that you're just like, Jesus, just something doesn't seem right. You know, don't, don't hesitate, talk to them, talk, you know, get them into counselors, get them into your doctor, whatever you got to do. Don't wait. Don't just brush it off. Um, it's really important. Um, I'll share a story, I guess there was a, Oh God, I'm going to start crying. Since I think about this girl, I start crying. So there was a girl years ago. Um, and I, I think I shared this story in that podcast too, if I remember. Anyway, um, years ago, she, she came in with, with her mom and she sat in my office and she wanted to um, talk about her mental health, I guess. She was cutting and things weren't going very well. And so I said, well, tell me about it so basically she was having problems with mom and dad were divorced dad was being real hard on her mom was trying to help her dad didn't believe in the learning disability that she had mom was trying to get support and there's not a lot of support in Saskatchewan her friends um I wouldn't say were being mean to her but they were you know teasing her and stuff like that and it was more in jest, I guess, as to how, how I would I would view it. And I think that's how she viewed it. But it started to take its toll on her because, you know, it's constant. You know, it's that, yeah, you can't read, blah, 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 you know, all those kind of things. And uh, it kind of took its toll on her. And, and like I said, she she became suicidal. She was cutting and, and wanted to kill herself. And she was young, like grade seven, like just horrible, horrible feelings to live, you know, with that kind of emotion um at that young of age so I ended up pulling her side and we had no idea that she had a learning disability um we ended up getting her tested and all that kind of stuff and sure enough she did and I tried you know tried to help her with different things and the special ed teacher tried to help her with, with certain things and strategies and we worked on her for about six or seven months and her and her mom came back into the office uh, uh, six or seven months later and and as a group, we kind of decided that maybe, you know, living with your mom in the city versus out here where, where we are in the town and going to a different school might be beneficial. Um, so she did. And I hadn't seen this girl for years, years and years. And one day she just rolls into the school and she, she says, Mr. Karras, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And she came, sat down in my office and she says, Mr. Karras, you're the best teacher I ever had. And I said, oh, what, what, and of course, me being the dummy I am sometimes, I said, oh, please, what the hell did I ever teach you, right? Never taught you any classes or anything like that. And this poor little girl, she had her head down and she lifts it up and she had, a, I forgot to remember, this. she had a tear, just one, just dribbling down the side of her face. And she said, you taught me not to be afraid. And I was just like, oh my God, like how, like, how does that happen, right? Like, how does that happen to, to not be afraid anymore so that she could tell people about her disability, that she could advocate for herself, that she wasn't afraid to, 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 to take risks, to set goals, to make plans. She was so afraid. She just lived in fear all this time. And, and again, that, I think that's why, oh, frick. I hate talking. This sucks. Okay. But anyway, that's why this is so important, you guys, because I might, you know, you see, oh, vice principal, I went through all of this too. You know, it, it is, it is tough. It's tough as a parent, I'm sure, but it's really hard as a kid too. Yeah, it really is. And now you've got me crying as well. 
<laughs> yeah, I went through it as a kid as well. I wasn't diagnosed until I was in grade nine and that was really hard. Um, but that part about helping her understand herself and get over her fear and be able to talk about it, you know, that's actually like that, that works perfectly for the next thing that I really wanted to talk about, which is really helping your kids understand what dyslexia is, you know? So I had an amazing teacher who spotted me like across the room when I was in grade nine, because she saw my writing, which was terrible, but I could understand everything and I could speak really well. And it was clear that I, I was doing things, but she knew like very quickly from my writing, uh, handwriting that is, because I, I typed most things and I spell check most things and, and I could, you know, get by under the radar as it were for a long time. But nobody ever told me after I was diagnosed what dyslexia was. I didn't have any language to talk about it. I was afraid to talk about it. I, I was accommodated in high school, which was great. Um, it was kind of a, a sort of ahead of the curve. I'm kind of old now, but it was ahead of the curve for the time they accommodated me. Um, but I felt like I was cheating because nobody told me what an accommodation was. Nobody told me what was dyslexia was. I had no idea how to write to that. So a big piece for me is really talking to kids about what dyslexia is and helping them understand what it is so that they have the language to explain it and so that they understand that there's nothing wrong with them. So I put in a couple of slides that are just like talking points for parents, because this is something that you can absolutely do and you can make sure your kids know that dyslexia is a neurologically based condition. So it's a brain-based condition. You're born this way. Um, and it, you know, it affects word level, reading, accuracy, fluency, and spelling. Um, but you know, it's not related to intelligence in any way. And it's also super common. This is something that I didn't know. I felt like I was just the odd person out, um, but I had no idea when I was in high school how common dyslexia is that you know it affects 10 to 20% of the population and how many kids that is. Um, it, it, I, I have always sort of gravitated towards other dyslexic people, but it's amazing because sometimes I've gone decades uh, really bonding with a person before we ever got around to talking about the fact that we both have dyslexia, you know? Uh, because it is super common, but um, if you're not talking about it, you'll never find those people. Um, but also just making the point to kids that, you know, dyslexia is not, um, it's not caused by anything that we did. You know, it's not the re result of your, you know, your parents, it's not their fault. It's not because of your lack of motivation and it's not because of intelligence. Absolutely not. Um, and then the other piece that I really like to, to point out, and I wish I had this when I was younger, and this is something that I try to do for my son for sure, is making sure that they have role models. And there are so many great adults now, like Michael, who, who are talking openly about their dyslexia. And uh, this is just an organization, if anybody's watching and hasn't uh, come across this one, this is made by dyslexia. They're out of the UK, uh, but they have lots of great videos. And if there's any sort of profession, career, aspiration that your child has, I assure you, you can find someone who is an adult who's successfully doing those things, um, openly talking about their dyslexia. Um, and I think that's really important to share with the kids as well. And my final thing on this before we get to the next question is just this book. This is my favorite book. It was actually written by a teenager who has dyslexia um, when he was in grade 10. And he was in the dumps, like he was, he was kind of feeling low. And he had a mom who was like me, who was constantly pushing the dyslexia propaganda on him. That's what my son accuses me of doing sometimes, where I'm constantly talking about these successful dyslexic adults and all the great things they've done. And, uh, you know, he was thinking to himself, well, yeah, that's great. But how on earth did this person go from being me in grade 10, you know, failing everything and just having problems in every part of my life to being them. Um, and so he got this idea over the summer between grade 10 and grade 11, he wrote a letter and he photocopied it and sent it off to a hundred people who he found on the internet listed as successful dyslexics. And then he um, started getting responses back from them and he journals it and he chronicles his entire year. But throughout the book, he in inserts a whole bunch of different tips and tricks and things that were really helpful for him as well as the copies of the letters he got. It's not a very long book. It's only about 80 pages, 80, 90 pages, and it's available as an audiobook on Audible. Um, but I highly recommend this one. Um, so into our next topic of discussion, which is really around the, the actual academic sports. So in the, um, in the podcast, Michael, 
uh, you were talking about making um, adaptation sheets for you know the teachers to help them. Um, so I think you're the perfect person to sort of give parents an overview of like what kind of academic supports really are available, like what should they be thinking about asking for, um, and how can parents really, um, well, be aware of what the sports are and ensure that it's the right supports for their kids. Sure, sure thing. Yeah, so again, there's, there's a billion supports, right? Um, but how we access them, if we need to access them or don't we, and, and what supports do we actually need um, and can take advantage of? Um, one of the biggest things, um, and everybody's gonna be at a different place, right? Um, I often get asked, what are, what are the five big things? And I think even Alicia asked this when I first talked to her, what are the five things? <laughs> but there is no five things, right? There is no five things. Every, every single one of your kids is gonna be different. And what works for one might not work for anyone else. And I'll, I'll give an example. I have a whiteboard in my office that's directly in front of me. And I've used it since I, uh, I think my second year teaching. And it's, it's in front of me, I have to look at it every day, parents write on it, teachers write on it, students write on it, sometimes I'll write on it, but it's my strategy, it's my tool, and it works for me. But it only works for me at work, it doesn't work for me at home, because I've tried it, and it doesn't work there. Do you know what I mean? So everybody's so different. So the support that you need and the, and the, or the academic support that you need and, and the strategies that you need and the tools you need are gonna be so different. There's no just, here's a list of 10 different things, do them and it'll, it'll, it'll solve the problem. And I think that's the biggest frustration for parents um, and, and for students is that there's a lot of trial and error. And it's really, it can be really frustrating because you'd be like, I tried this, and it didn't work or I tried this and it didn't work and sometimes that's just the way it goes do you know what I mean um the best thing that I could do is is when, when I get kids is I try to sit down and I go through all of their um like IQ their Woodcock Johnson their Wyatt's thing like that and I'll try and pick out where their strengths are what things they're they struggle with and I really really focus on trying to use their strengths to strengthen their weaknesses so that the strategies they implement will, will not only work around the stuff they can't do, but it will help them learn how to do the stuff they can't do at the time. So it goes from I can't do it to I'm struggling with it, to I'm having difficulty with it, to I can do it. Do you know what I mean? So. It's that kind of kind of things. Now, specific supports out there, um, and every every school is going to be different. I can't speak to, to every school. I can only speak to what what I've done in the past as a special ed teacher and what we do here at, at the school. Um, I have a fabulous special ed teacher. I would say probably the best in my whole division, um, and she runs things very similar to to what I did. Um, I literally would make a record of adaptation for every single kid that came into the school. When I was a special ed teacher, um, it was a school about 500, 5, 510, somewhere around there, 500 kids. So roughly 100 kids in every grade, four classes, roughly of, of, of every, every uh, uh, grade, 25-ish kind of per, per class. And I would meet with every single kid in the school. Coming in, if they were new to the school, I'd meet with them if they, we're coming from grade eight, I'd go over to, there was three elementary schools. I went to every elementary school. I talked with the grade eight uh, uh, classes and just told them who I was, what I did, that they can come see me for anything. Didn't matter if they never saw a special ed teacher before. If they had certain things that they liked the way they learned, then I'd put it and they could, I, they could prove it to me. I'd put it on the record at ad adaptations and the teachers had to follow through with it. Now, I had a very good administrators at the time that if a teacher came to them and said, hey, Mr. Karras is saying this student needs to wear headphones. There's nothing even wrong with this kid. He has no diagnosis or nothing. The principal would say, if Karras wrote it on that sheet and he told you to do it, then do it. And th that doesn't happen everywhere. I realize that, right? Um, but 
by doing that, it opened up the doors for the kids that actually needed a lot of support to get it because they were the teachers were then semi-forced to follow through with these record of adaptations. And again, I made it very general, but I also made it very specific too. And I got a, I, I got a friend, his name's Rory, and he kind of balked me a bit. He taught calculus 30, you know, physics 30, things like that. And he, I'd give him these record of adaptations and, and he would be like, why do I have to do this? And so on and so on. He's a large man. And, and I went into his, into his class one day and I said, I just gave him little tips. Like you do these things for, for uh, uh, you know, Joe Schmo over here, but do it for the whole class. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, don't single him out that you're doing it just for him. Do it for the whole class. So he started doing things for the whole class, even though he was doing it for that one student. And about six or seven months later, he came back to me and he said, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing, Mike. He goes, I'm getting through my whole course faster than I normally would by doing these things. And I said, I know. And he's like, well, how do you know that? And I said, because what works for that kid also works for the whole general population, right? Um, it's kind of that universal design, right? If, if you think about it that way, why do we have curbs that, you know, go down so wheelchairs can go up and well, they're great for bikes, they're great for strollers, you know, they're, they're, they're good for all kinds of things, right? Your, your wheelbarrow, whatever you use it. So it's not just for people with, with, uh, uh, with wheelchairs, right? So we have lots of these things and we can do that as teachers in the education system as well. And students and parents can do these things to help themselves in the education system as well. And when it comes to specific academic supports, again, I don't know what everybody has in their school, what classes they offer, um, if they get EA support or not, if you get IEPs um, or not, like in Saskatchewan, kids with di dyslexia don't get IEPs. There's no EA support, um, you know, educational associate uh, assistant support. Um, but that being said, there is lots of outside agency support. There's, you know, that, that kids can go to. There's lots of um, um, tutoring supports that kids can go to um, that are specific and targeted to kids with learning disabilities in Saskatchewan. So um, that's the, the, the kind of trade-off we have here, I guess. Also, um, it's my understanding that some of the larger schools uh, in Saskatchewan, they'll have, um, I don't wanna say, like learning disability classes, but they have like classes to help them learn how to be organized. They don't get credit for them, but like learn how to do school, I guess. Um, kind of like when I say we have the resource room spare, but they they take an actual class, right? Um, so the, there, there's those as well. I would highly recommend that you find out what academic supports are offered at the school you're, you're enrolling in. Um, and, and, you know, trial and error, find out what you can take, what you can use, what, what, what will work, what won't, and find out what's in your community and, and surrounding community. There might be, you know, uh, um, I, I personally went to the Learning Disability Association of Saskatchewan, and I accessed their, their services, and they were fantastic for me. Um, so everybody, everybody has to, has to kind of find what works for them. Um, and again, maybe it, it might cost money, it might not, um, but, but yeah, it depends on, on where you are, and I know some people are isolated. Um, I teach at a, a small rural school, um, and a lot of the, the people here um, aren't particularly wealthy, they don't have a lot of benefits with the jobs that they, they do have, um, and it's really difficult for them to access any kind of services, whether it's mental health services, counseling, or academic supports, um, even a library. Um, so here as a school, we recognize that. So we try to, to provide those things uh, as best we can, whether it's feeding kids in the morning, which we do every morning. We have, you know, we serve breakfast to everybody in the school every morning to we have an open library that sits at the front of the school right when you walk in uh, that I had some of the kids make in the, the shop. And when the library tech comes in and pulls books that are no good, we put them in there and we just say, take them, take them home so you you can read at home. You know, so find out what supports are there um, and ensure that those supports are, are, are in place. Um, the hardest thing um, I think is 
not getting the supports, but it's the actual following through with supports. So um, I'll use some specifics. So say you find out that your son or daughter excels really well when it comes to uh, test if they're able to do it orally, right? So they're allowed to, um, um, you know, talk about the test with the teacher. Um, sounds good on paper, we'll write it in the IEP, whatever, but does it actually happen, right? That's the thing you got to kind of check on. And as a grade nine student, that's really hard to go up to your teacher and say, hey, I'm supposed to, you know, have my tests orally, you know what I mean? But um, and I know we're going to get into that. So there's a self advocacy advocacy slide, right? So uh, kind of lead into that too. But that that moves into that point where you know using those academic supports and following through with them, um, and self advocating for yourself as a student, but also advocating for your child, um, making sure that those supports are are being used. Now they're gonna they're gonna slip up, right? And should your son and daughter get every test orally? Probably not. They still need to know how to learn how to write, right? Um, and things like that. But when it comes to, you know, the big, the big outcomes and, and they're testing them on those, those big outcomes, sure, they, they should get those supports. I had them right through uni in university. Um, I used to go to the professor's home and they would, we would discuss it, the tests, and it was, it was fantastic. But if I wrote it down, it was a, you know, you couldn't read it and I would fail everything then, right? So just find out what supports are, are available. Make sure that you have the strategies and, and things that that uh, that you know work and, and get them in place as soon as you can. And then just check, just check to see if they're being used. And if they're not, give them a kind nudge and say, hey, please, you know, this is really important to us. And most most schools, and almost all teachers are going to be willing to do it. Are they going to remember? Eh, that's where we have problems, right? So, so just just help help us out as parents and, and the kids to to advocate for yourselves, and we'll we'll make sure it happens. That's the teacher principal part of me talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you made a lot of really good points there. Um, There's a couple things that stood out for me, like the the one about um, your friend who was the calculus teacher who mm -hmm. realized that by putting these things in place, you know, it made his life easier and all the kids succeeded. That was a similar experience that we had when I was advocating when my son was in like maybe grade four and was still really, 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 really struggling with reading. Um, and, but he's really good at science and he's really good at math, right? And I was like, I know he knows the stuff. He just can't read the questions on the test. Right? So his teacher came up with a great idea and like she was giving a, like a multiple choice test or whatever. She put all the questions on slides, put it up on the smart board for everybody. And she read the question out for everybody, read the answers, A, B, C, D. All the kids filled them in. She's just like, that was so much better. I'm going to do multiple choice tests that way forever, you know? There's yeah. so many kids. And, 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 but, and nobody in the class knew the difference, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he just, wasn't singled out. You know, yeah, exactly. he, got, he did great, got 100%. And, yeah. and she said there were a bunch of other kids who, who, you know, probably had similar problems, but hadn't been identified or whatever. And, and they did better as well. So yeah. on, a, on a side note, I'm going to read you guys a, a letter from Rory, actually, um, that he sent. This is, oh God, this is dated... 2010, so a long time ago. So he had a, a, his nephew, a sister-in-law, um, his son was, or their son was struggling. I think he was 14 um, in elementary school. He was going to grade, grade nine. And he, he had said that, um, uh, I'll just read it. He says, unfortunately, the teachers and special ed teachers at the school were little of no help for, for him while he was there. Um, he has an undiagnosed learning disability at the time uh, related to languages and writing. And when he was in grade two, his teacher told his parents that he should be held back due to his poor academic progress. So instead of giving up, they chose to travel two hours um, one way um, each and every week for four years to take him to what, uh, a place called Sylvan Learning Center. I don't know if you guys have those in your provinces, but we have a a place called Sylvan, Sylvan Learning Center. It's like a tutoring center is basically, um, not specific to learning disabilities, just for, for anybody. Um, and they'd hoped that this would be, uh, you know, their magic, magic cure. 
Um, there was slow project progress, um, but uh, and, they, and he wanted to give up many times, but they they persevered and and um, things didn't really get a whole lot better. Um, when he was in grade seven, they came to inquire how things worked at the high school, and um, they were unsure how to approach the high school teachers about Adam's struggles. They were quite certain that it would would only be getting or going to get worse, and were concerned how he would survive in high school. Rory advised them to come to Saskatoon to meet with me. And um, he said, I arranged a meeting with Mike and um, my sister-in-law. Um, and Mike simply asked that Adam bring along his Woodcock Johnson IQ and aptitude tests from elementary school. So the Wyatt and, and things along those lines. Um, and I wanted him to complete a multiple intelligence test um, that I gave him as well and bring those results. So when he did, I sat down with him and I went through the tests and, and I asked him a bunch of questions about how he learned, um, when, the, when the teacher's writing notes, how does he pay attention? How does he write a notes? How does he write assignments? And I went through a whole battery of just different questions, um, trying to figure out how this kid learned and, you know, where he, where he was. He had a high IQ, you know, he was a visual spatial kind of learner. Um, so from there, I sat down and I started giving him different things that he could do, the student himself could do. And I also gave specific things that the parents could do. And Rory wrote these all down. He said, as they talked, I grabbed a piece of paper and wrote down Mike's suggestions and gave them to, to them when they were finished. The meeting lasted approximately 30 to 60 minutes and it cost me two packs of deer sausage. <laughs> I mean, <made, laughs> two packs of deer sausage. Anyway, um, after grade nine, the boy had made the honor roll. So it goes to show that if you actually, you know, set some goals for yourself, you plan out your education, you find the right academic supports and the strategies that work for you, you can go from being completely undiagnosed and getting no support to, you know, making the honor roll in just a matter of months, you know, so it, it, it can happen. So don't, don't get too discouraged is my point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would say that's, that is true. I'll say as well for my son, who's just, you know, in grade nine right now, um, the whole high school format seems to suit him so much better than elementary school did. You know, in Ontario, he's got four classes per semester. Um, so he's only got four things to worry about instead of, you know, all of the things to worry about at the same time. So it's just easier for him to stay organized than it was before. So I was super, super nervous last spring about this time, <laughs> about the transition. Any parents who are out there who are super, super nervous right now. Um, but it's been a pretty good year is what I'd say. Um, yeah. Uh, there's some questions in the chat as well, but you know what, maybe we'll go through the slides and then I'll get to those. Um, I will, I will get to your questions in the chat, but we'll do the next couple slides and then we'll get to those at the end. Um, so our next uh, piece about support was really around logistical support. And, and what I mean by this in terms of logistical support is around um, those everyday sort of things. I chose a picture of a locker with a combination lock on it because this is my nightmare. <laughs> like, I don't know how many times as a grown up still, I have not been able to open a combination lock at the Y, at the, they make fun of me. Got to the point where they would, I, I give them my combination and they put it in the computer at the desk at the Y because I was forgetting it so often and getting locked out of my locker. So as a kid going into high school, this was one of my nightmares too. Um, and this was, you know, actually my son was fine with this, but I, I was, you know, a little traumatized by this. So I got him his lock in like uh, July and made him practice doing it over the summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other big one for me was like getting lost, finding my classes, right? Um, so we had a, a good thing where uh, the high school that he goes to had a program where the grade eight students could go in and do a class in the, in the high school when they were in grade eight, just once a week after school. Uh, so we leaned into that and that class was, it was a bit of a joke, to be honest. They had like treasure hunts around the school, but it meant he got really physically familiar with the building. So he could like downplay that anxiety that I had. Um, but what are some of the other sorts of issues that you see, like logistically, organizational, whatever it is that, you know, 
you found in the students that you've supported, things that parents could maybe be on the lookout for and, uh, you know, being proactive to sort of support with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, like, just to, to, to go on what you said, go and visit the building, go and visit it early, go and visit it often. Um, find out where classes are, find out where teachers are. The, usually, you know, names will be on the doors or, or something along those lines, or some of the big schools will have like an English wing and math wing and chemistry wings, you know what I mean? So you know, know where you're going. Um, the worst thing I think you could do to a kid with a learning disability or ADD is just unleash them into the building the first day. No idea where they're going. It's like my first time at Toronto airport. I'm like waving people down. I'm like, hey, I can't read. I don't know where I am. I'm by myself. My wife's not here. Please help. You know what I mean? Like a, like a lost puppy. Um, but the same thing goes for, 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 you know, a 14 year old walking into a big school like that, you know, they're going to be pretty scared, right? So if you go check them out and you know what, go to more than one high school. I, I, here we have open houses at the high schools. I don't know if you guys have those where kids can come and visit, go, go to multiple high schools. Even if you know you're not going to go to that high school, go check one out anyway, because you get more, a little bit more comfortable walking around, seeing other kids. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just the whole atmosphere. And, it, you know, it's hard to find that time as a family. Sometimes you might have dance and all these kind of things to go to hockey, whatever else, but take the time. It's really important, right? This is your kid's education. Take the time, go to two or three different schools, check it out. Usually the teachers will be there. You can talk to them. You can talk to the special ed teachers. You can find out what type of lockers they have. Maybe they have com locks. Maybe they don't. Lots of kids, I will, like we have a com lock uh, policy at our school that they have to buy the locks from the school and so on and so on. But any kid with a learning disability or disability in general that can't use a com lock, they can use a key lock. If we keep, we, they just have to give us one of the keys, right? or the homeroom teacher one of the keys so that if they lose it or if there's you know a reason that we need to get into the locker we can get into the locker without having to cut the lock off you know stuff like that um so i have absolutely no like most most people shouldn't have any problems with with those kind of things at their school um but yeah go often some of these schools are huge like i uh, think one of the bigger ones in saskatoon has 2600 kids in it that's a massive school like that's a really big school like <laughs> that's like five 500 and some kids graduating in every grade right um so you can get lost in them pretty quick um if you don't know where you're going some of the other uh logistical supports um there there is a really and this is really unethical of me there is a really good chance of you running into a real jerk of a teacher in high school i'm just putting it out there there's no, you're, you're never going to win. You're never going to, you're never going to, you know what I mean? You're, you can argue to your, to your, your, your blue in the face. You're never going to win with this teacher. They're everywhere, right? It is, you can, you can, don't even bother complaining to them. Just go straight to the special ed teacher, go straight to the principal, um, try to get your son or daughter removed from that class and put in a different section um or something along those lines there that that teacher is the reason i became a teacher myself right because i had several of them in, in my career as a student in in elementary school and in high school and they are awful and they will make your life miserable i don't know why they became teachers i don't know how they continue to be teachers they all should be fired if they ever worked at my school they would be gone in a heartbeat so I don't know how they remain on staffs, but they do. It's just a fact of life that we got to live with. I think that is the biggest barrier that almost every single one of you will run into at some point in their high school career. But don't lose your mind over it. Just do what you got to do to get through. Um, and like I said, there's a few things like try and get removed or have your son or daughter move to a different section or something along those lines. Um, what other logistical things? Um, little things like bus, um, transportation to and from school um, can be really important. 
Um, if you're not getting dropped off and picked up by mom every day or dad, um, which also might be a logistical <laughs> problem of embarrassment, I don't know, your son or daughter, but um, those can be things as well that they might want to plan routes, bus routes, do them a few times before um, they go. Um, again, every, every school is a bit different. I don't know where um where if proximity you know if you have public transit or if you have like school transit um here at my school everybody is pretty much bust in so so or they drive in but those are those are some some big things as well um also too i think um it's really important to have like um the proper binders and things like that everybody wants oh i want this fancy binder and this and that have the proper binder you need as a student and if you know have a system like i used to have a different binder for every class so and they were color coded so that i didn't screw things up do you know what i mean um and then the last thing is routine um <laughs> this happened to me on Tuesday so my in-laws are staying at my house so my routine's a little bit messed up to begin with and my routine is pretty simple I get up at 5 30 in the morning I have a shower brush my teeth get dressed I go upstairs I make uh, coffee I fill the sink I empty the dishwasher I do a bit of dishes I start making the kids lunches I make myself my breakfast and my lunch and all that kind of stuff I pour myself a coffee, eat my breakfast, and I watch TV for 15 minutes, get into the car, and I drive to work. That's my morning. It's the same every day. It's been that way for 14 years. Any little change can screw me for the whole day. So <laughs> I, I forgot to empty the pot of coffee before I hit the button. So it overflowed everywhere. And then everything went to hell. I was like 25 minutes late for work. I was like, the kids didn't had the wrong lunches. Like just every, but it throws you off, right? It just throws everything out of whack. So having that routine and keeping it the same will make everything run smooth. Er. <laughs> er. Um, so that logistics wise, finding a routine that works and, it, and keeping it as consistent as possible for that morning and throughout the day is the best thing you can do. That's great advice. Uh, somebody popped in the chat as well that there's a kind of combination lock that actually looks like a combination lock, but only has one number, which I've never heard of before, but this is brilliant. <laughs> that, that would be brilliant. <laughs> I bet I could still forget what the number was though, unless I could pick the number and it would be personally significant <laughs> to me. <laughs> But that's great to know. Thank you, whoever put that in the chat. Um, so on to our last topic, and then we'll get to the questions that have been put in the chat because there are a few, um, is uh, around the self-advocacy piece. And so we've talked about this a little bit already for sure, um, but we'll just launch right into it. You know, like why is it really important and, and how can parents help their kids to develop those skills? Sure. Yeah, the, this is really, really important for your child. Um, to learn this like I know all parents are really good at advocating for their for their for their children but the the key is to get them to advocate for themselves and this goes back to some of the 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 communication I was talking about um, it also it also has a big help with the mental health stuff it, 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 the self-advocacy is the thing that ties everything together your sons your daughters they need to know themselves they need to know what they can do what they can't do what they have difficulty with what they can do to work around those difficulties they need to know what learning disability they have they, if it's dyslexia they need to know what dyslexia is they need to be able to explain it to people they need to be able to explain it to the teacher and they can't be afraid to do that one of the the, the craziest things I think I ever did and people laugh at me all the time as I went into my my uh, job interview, um, it was a, a my first job interview with uh, uh, Martinsville High School. Um, I, I walked in, and there was like the superintendent, there's board members, there's the principal, the vice principal, you know, all, all sitting there. 
uh, um, at the interview and they're like, do you want to take a minute to, you know, prepare yourself? And I'm like, no, let's get her going. And they're like, okay, tell us about yourself. And, and literally just blurted out, maybe it's the ADD in me. I just said, I'm Michael Karras and I got a learning disability in ADD and I want to teach kids how to read. Just out of <laughs> and, and they, but I wasn't, I wasn't embarrassed about it. You know, I wasn't, I, 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 I cracked jokes about it. I use humor about it. You know what I mean? So there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of, of who you are. Yeah, I have a learning disability. Yeah, I struggle with this stuff. I have difficulty with this. There's some things I just, I cannot do. But you know what? If if everybody knows that around me and I'm willing to help them, they're willing to help me. And that's what I found. And if I can go to my teacher and say, hey, I got a learning disability. I need some help from you. Um, these are some of the things that I need that I know that that work. I don't need this one all the time, but I do need it sometimes. I need this one all the time. This one I, I, I need only sometimes in these occasions. I can let you know when I need them so you don't have to remember. Make their life as easy as possible. But just letting them know keeps everything, uh, keeps everything rolling easy, I guess. Does that make sense? Am I making sense here? Like. Yeah, it totally does. It totally does. That ability to just uh, talk about it, right? Like, which is something that I wasn't able to do until I was an adult, for sure. And I'm like, so incredibly proud of my son, because I've had teachers come up to me, like, uh, you know, in the parking lot or whatever, that just subbed in for his class one day, or just like, so your son came up to me and said, Andrew didn't sound said he had dyslexia. Is that okay? I'm like, yes, that's amazing. Absolutely. That's perfect. That's what we want, right? Yeah. That, that, and that, that's the thing. And like, this might sound bad, but this is how I met my wife. But like, I, I, I had to self-advocate right from the start, like right from very, very young. It was the only way I could learn stuff because I couldn't read, right? So what I would do, and again, this sounds terrible, I would find hot, smart girls <laughs> and I would make them my best goddamn friend in the world. I really would. And I was, I was large, I was a big kid that was quite athletic and, and I, was, I was usually quite popular. I had lots of friends and stuff like that. And, you know, I didn't care that this, this girl was the geeky girl that everybody didn't like. I didn't give a damn because she could help me, right? And where teachers didn't have the time or didn't have the, the knowledge, I knew what I needed. And these, and if I made friends with this person who knows how to do this stuff just naturally, maybe I could figure stuff out from them. And that's how I started to like advocate for myself is try to, again, it sounds horrible. I used other people to help myself is what I did, right? And again, that's how I ended up marrying my wife, you know, hot, smart girl, and then does, does all the stuff that I hate to do and is really good <laughs> at it and, and keeps, me, keeps me on target and plans everything. And, and, but, but I need that in my life, right? And because those are the things I really, really struggle with. And so that's, that's what you need to teach your sons and daughters is how to, like, again, advocate for themselves, but appropriately, right? We're not, I'm not asking for things I don't need. I'm not asking for things I just want, right? I'm asking for things I act, actually need, and I'm not abusing those things either, right? If I don't actually need the copy of the notes, I'm not going to ask for it. But if I need them, then yeah, you know, like, if, if I was just too lazy to write stuff down and I can write it down then I shouldn't get them. So, you know, you got to be, you got to learn to draw the line with yourself, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's like that whole finding people who can help you with the things that you yeah. need help with, I think is just super important all around, whether it's somebody who you're going to date or just friends. Yeah. I remember in kindergarten, actually, I made friends with the only girl in class who could read. Of course, I didn't know I was dyslexic in kindergarten, but I was like, wow, that's cool. And I followed her around for all the way through to the end of high school. It was great. And uh, she helped me through so many things, right? You know, because she was, you know, the smartest kid in class and she knew all the math and she knew all the reading. And I'd always uh, do my homework with her. So it was great. You know, leaning into your friends is good. Yeah. Like another tip for building self-advocacy that's interesting is in terms of uh, getting kids involved in programs where they can um, actually advocate for others. So there are some interesting programs. There's one, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, Michael, called Eye to Eye. Have you ever heard of that? Eye to Eye. It's a program out of um, 
it's out of the States, but they have chapters all over the place. I've wanted to bring one to Canada. And what they do is they take kids that have ADHD and dyslexia, one or the other or both, who are in high school or university, and then they pair them up with middle school kids uh, for you know a six month period. And they go into the school and they do an advocacy program. That's a curriculum that's been developed. So it's like one high school or university kid with one middle school kid. And they teach the middle school kid how to self-advocate. But they've done studies on the program. And what they have found out is that, you know, the middle school kids benefit, yes. But the biggest benefit is to those high school students and university students who are teaching the younger kids how to self-advocate, which I think is really, really interesting. interesting. I'd love to bring that to Canada if anybody's interested in helping me do that. (laughs) uh, One of the things I was going to mention, too, about this is another reason this is so important is that if you don't know how to self-advocate for yourself, chances are you're not going to get what you need which then leads to you know i'm no good at i'm failing everything i'm not doing this i refuse to do it i don't need to do it screw you guys i hate you mom and dad leave me the f alone you know what i mean like and that's that's what happens so that's why this is really important and and i think i mentioned it earlier the when you don't do this or don't know have the skill to do this and I did at the time I I still have like I was able to do this I still ended up in that avenue right so it's really important that you you kind of work at this with 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 your sons and daughters to try and get them hey you've got to ask did you ask you know did you ask your teacher about this no but and the other thing is you can help them by asking you know, telling the teacher ahead of time. Um, often I, I will do that. Um, and, and I, or I'll even talk to the talk to um, parents. I'll say, I'm trying to get your kid to self-advocate for themselves. So um, when he comes home tonight or when she comes home tonight, um, ask them like prompting questions, like, and I'll give them examples. Hey, how was school today? What did you do? Um, did you, Mr. Karras, did you see him today? Blah, blah, blah. Did you guys chat? Oh yeah. What'd you chat about? And it forces them to tell, oh, Mr. Karras was teaching me about self-advocacy. Oh yeah. Well, what did he say? What are some of the things? You know what I mean? And then you you just kind of work with the parent or I'm not like, I'm talking to teachers here. I work with the parents um, to try and get them on board to do the same thing that I'm doing here at the school without the kid knowing it. So we're kind of kind of screwing them into doing what we want them to do. <laughs> tag teaming. I call it tag teaming. <laughs> Without them knowing, right? So they end up building those self-advocacy skills um, and they think they're doing it all on their own, which they are in part, right? Um, but we don't ever let them know that we were involved behind the scenes, but it gives them some success, right? Because then they go to the, they'll go to the teacher the next day and say, hey, um, you know, would it be possible to have, have you know, Miss V read, read this English test to me? Well, sure. Do you know what I mean? The teacher, but the teacher already had it already planned and set up already, right? And then we work on the next step, you know, and how do you go about doing this? And how do you go about doing this then? Once you get permission to do it, what do you do from there, right? So it's all those little learned kind of, kind of skills um, that you might have to work in partnership with the teacher or the special ed teacher to make those things happen. But yeah, really important, really, really important. Definitely. Um, so I'm gonna stop the share. That brings us to the end of our, our sort of planned questions. We did have some questions in the chat. So um, one of them was from a parent who's asking about um, a child who's really resistant. So she's asking, or, or he, I'm not sure, I, I don't know. The parent is asking, uh, what do you do with uh, resistant tough kids who deny that they have a problem? Um, so this child gets into a lot of trouble in school. He's acting out, um, trying to avoid work, refusing, um, refusing testing, refusing therapy, um, that sort of thing. Um, people, uh, yeah, he's saying, yeah, I don't need to read in my future job. Um, so how do you advocate uh, to help for a kid who, uh, who's refusing? You're laughing. Is, did you say that when you were there? Like I don't need to read for my future job. I think I've said that a few times too. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I feel for this person. I don't know who it is, but I, I certainly feel for them. Um, that's tough. That is really, really tough. 
Um, I'm assuming, you know, this the, the kid is grade seven or eight here because this is about going into high school. So that's also really young to be, you know, that down on themselves. Um, I don't have, I don't have an answer. I, I, I just don't have an answer. This is a mental health issue, right? Like it's, they've gone down that, that kind of, that hill that I was talking about that we want to avoid at all costs, right? Um, I was, I was 19 when that happened. You know, you're looking at, you know, what, what are you in grade eight, 13, 14? You know, that's really young and I feel for you, whoever this is. I don't have the answers, but I would strongly, strongly suggest just keep being positive. Let them know that you love them, that you're not gonna give up on them. Oh, just that's so, that's so hard. Try and get them in counseling. Just, just do whatever you got to do. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. I know that's a really, really hard one for sure. Um, sorry, there's no, another one. I just to, to, to continue on that one thing. My mom was always, always positive. If I came home with like a, like a 40%, we'll say she would say oh that's really good Michael last time you got 37 percent you know like she always tried to find something positive even though I was really down or do you know what I mean um she praised me for things that I did like instead of getting pissed at me like if she said take the garbage out and wheel the recycling out and take the dog for a walk and maybe I only took the dog for a walk and I didn't do the other two things, I wouldn't get in trouble for it. They would say, oh, thank you for taking the dog for a walk, but you forgot to take the, or take the trash out. Can you go do it now? So it was more of a, a positive thing versus a, you know, you didn't take the goddamn garbage out and yelling at me. You know what I mean? Am I making sense here? Because those are the things that really, because it's not my fault. I didn't, like, it's not that I forgot. I just, it, it went in in one ear and out the other. You're absolutely right as a parent when you say that. Went in one ear and out the other. Because I only heard one thing and it was walk the dog, right? I didn't <laughs> it's the last it. thing you heard. Yeah. Well, it could, it, but, it, that, but it's the truth, right? And to yeah. get mad at me for that as a child, I'm going, but I didn't even know you said that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting in trouble for something I didn't even know is how I'm viewing it as a kid. So I, I don't, I, again, whoever, whoever you are, I feel for you. I don't have an answer, but just don't, don't give up. Just don't give up. Definitely. It sounded from the, um, from your podcast keynote as well, that you were really heavily involved in athletics and sports when you were younger. Um, was that true when you were in elementary school as well? Or was that just something um, that came about later? we I played whatever I could in elementary school like whatever they had we were pretty poor like we didn't have a lot of money for for stuff um but I just I played whatever high school sports elementary sports they had and uh it was kind of my outlet to keep me keep me going um if I didn't because I was on unmedicated back then um so I was just go 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 and then I'd crash and then I'd get up and I'd just go again. And I, I just didn't stop. And without the sports, um, I probably would have drove everybody mental, I think. Like, I don't know. Because, like, I'd, I'd get up in the morning, go to school in high school. And, you know, we'd do aerobics in the morning. I'd have a shower at school. We'd go to class. Um, I'd work out at lunch in the weight room, go to class. Then we'd either have football practice after at the beginning of the year uh wrestling practice um or track practice or something at school throughout the year and then i played um provincial soccer on the provincial team um in high school so then as soon as practice was over at school i'd go play soccer for two hours every night and then i'd go home and i i did that like and we'd have you know two 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 hour practices on the weekends for soccer and it went year round. So I never stopped, never stopped. 
but yeah I just think that's so important in terms of having an outlet like that refuge where you are doing something that you are feeling successful at that you can get the energy out all those things um so that that's really good I don't know that that helps to answer the the question though it really doesn't in terms of the kid that's refusing help it can be really difficult but I think I echo what Michael says in terms of you know just hang in there and, and try your best to get that try, try and find forward. something that you can connect them with like that's the yeah. other thing like oh it's it, it, I, I, I'm stuck on this this poor poor person here I don't know who they are but if you can if you can find someone or something that they can connect to that might bring them back in I, I don't know. I just, I, I wish I knew, I wish I had an answer for you. Yeah, that's hard. I think as well, in terms of if there's anybody in your life that has um, a learning disability that can be open with the child about it, like that's been really helpful in my household because it's not just me, you know, <laughs> like it runs in the family, but we have friends as well that have been very, very, that maybe have never been open with other adults, even that have been open with my son about their own struggles. And that's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. um for sure uh there's one more question i want to get to around um just managing the workload so the question is around how does the dyslexic student manage the reading workload um in the classroom and this is something i will say i definitely struggled with as high school went on and when i got into university um but i'll let you answer michael yeah sure again it, it's different for every kid some kids can read better than others some have difficulty um some like I found out I could read for five to seven minutes before everything kind of get all messed up on me and I stop remembering and I'd have to go back and reread. Um, but as I got older, I started to find out different tricks and different things that I could do. I found that if I read in a, in the tub with hot water, I could focus longer is strange <laughs> things though. This, this is what I mean, that trial and error, right? Like finding things that work for you and, and, and might work for somebody else. They might not, uh, uh, for somebody else, but I also, um, had a lot of friends read to me out loud, which was nice. Um, again, that the hot smart girl thing, but, um, but, but I hope it, that's but just your wife you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> But, but, it, but it worked, right? Like, and, and, and having, having, having people read to you, um, nowadays there's audio books, you know, almost everything you put is put on an audio book. Um, now, should you never read on your own? Absolutely not. Reading is really important. Um, even more important for, for people like us. Um, we need to read, but having someone read part, part of it for you. Um, I think that the most beneficial way for me to read a book or whether it's a textbook or or a, a novel was learning um how to read so if you're reading a textbook it's different than reading a novel i didn't know that when i was younger right so when you're reading a textbook there's bolded words and why are they bolded and no one had ever taught me this stuff right um so do you have to read everything in the textbook well not necessarily in a novel, yeah, you want to read everything, right? Because they're, we're looking for different stuff. The nice thing about both, though, is that when you have someone that you can read it with out loud, take turns or whatever, um, you can stop when you don't understand something and ask questions to, of each other or ask questions to the teacher or a parent or whoever happens to be around. And that's how I was able to manage the workload. Um, when I was growing up um, at schools now, though, most teachers, especially if you, you know, advocate for yourself and let them know that you have have difficulties with reading or whatever it might be. Um, most teachers, again, will give, you know, reasonable extensions, um, will slow certain areas of it down for you, will um, uh, apply certain modifications or adaptations um or accommodations for for that novel uh possibly leaving certain things out as long as they can assess the outcome right because that's what we're assessing is the outcome um for for what we're doing um is the outcome that you read every word cover to cover by yourself i've never seen that in the curriculum right so if that's what they're requiring well why right if I have to read every word in this novel by myself, cover to cover, 
it's not in the curriculum so why is that why is that a problem right so these are the things that you can talk to the teacher about right definitely yeah the audiobooks are really um, helpful when it comes to textbooks too like um, YouTube is amazing now you can find so many different uh, lecture series that are recorded that go along with textbooks. So I, I went back to university again, many times, <laughs> a lifelong learner, we'll say, when, uh, when my kids were little and I was taking some really technical courses and I was just really struggling through the textbook. And then I just like searched around on YouTube and I found a lecture series that was open, it was online and they followed through the textbook and the professor had made slides. And so I'd read the textbook, but then I watched the whole thing and it was, that's how I got through that course. So um, that's, if you, if you look, you can find either a digital version or you can find an audio version of almost anything these days, if you look hard enough. Well, and, and like um, a kid showed me this the other day, he can take his phone. I don't know what app it was, but he could take his phone, take a picture of the, any page, written textbook, handwritten and then he takes a picture of it, turns it into some sort of PDF, and then his reader on his phone will read it out loud for him. Yes, you could like, do that with uh, Microsoft Lens. It's a free app. Is that what it is? Maybe that's what it's called. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's great. It's like, and you can listen sweet. to it right on your phone. And it yeah. does all the different fonts. It's Yeah, it's really good. I use that one um, quite a bit. That's great. Um, I think we are actually coming to the, the close of our webinar. I think we can keep talking for quite a long time. I've really enjoyed this. I hope you have as well. Um, so I, I want to say thank you very much for joining us and having this conversation. I think it's really important for parents and for anybody who's watching this or with us today. Uh, you can always reach out to Dyslexia Canada as well. If you just in, a, email info at dyslexiacanada.org. We have a team of volunteers who are ready to answer your questions, uh, to help you find local supports, as Michael was talking about within your community, um, different associations that might be helpful for your child, um, help you with advocating for your child at school, understanding the questions to ask. Uh, we often read parents, uh, read IEPs, read psych eds with parents and help you understand what those terms mean and, and how you can bring your questions forward to the school. Um, so please uh, keep in touch with us. Thank you for joining us and thank you very much, Michael. And I'll say good night to everyone. And thank you, Sandra, as well. Thank you.